Not a single question. <laughs> yes, ma'am. What about the fair tax? What about the fair tax? Um, as I campaign, I talk about what I call the three legs of the stool we need to deal with most dramatically. The first leg of that stool is getting the absolutely immoral levels of debt that we have brought down. The second leg of the stool is to dramatically reform the federal government imposed regulatory environment that is absolutely killing American business. The third leg of that debt is we have to dramatically reform the tax process. You know, we are one of those nations that still does it the old way. We tax the creation of wealth. The very people that we're hoping are going to, in this tough time, go out and make the investments and create the jobs, we need to move towards a system that taxes the consumption rather than the creation of wealth. The fair tax is certainly one of those models. There are a couple other ones out there. I don't think we'll ever see the day when, you know, on December 31st of one year, we go from the IRS and the current system to a brand new system. I think it's something we phased in. I have not signed a pledge to say the fair tax is the way to go, but I do believe consumption tax is the way to go. And I think one of those models is, or some combination of the models is the way we need to start looking in the future. Virtually all the nations that are really succeeding right now are much more oriented towards consumption taxes than they are the old system. And by the way, one reason I believe in that so strongly, I go back to what I said before, it's about skin in the game. Every single American should be paying something in taxes. Nobody should get a free ride at the hands of SEAL Team 6, at the hands of the United States military. We all get the benefit of that security and freedom they provide. Everybody should be paying some minimum level of income taxes or taxes. construction people who are on a cash business. There's a huge uh, drug, even the drug market that's on a cash business. They don't have to declare anything. And if they had to pay a federal tax to get toilet paper, they'd pay for the streets and the highways like the rest of us. <clears throat> I heard on Bloomberg News the other day, uh, an expert on there said that if Obama would open up the Gulf, 200,000 jobs in the oil industry could be Created. I wondered what you think about that and the Anwar, uh, I think it's how you pronounce it, in, in Alaska. Yeah. And also, how do you feel about the military draft? Wow, that's a wide range question. You know, in reverse order, let me go that way. Um, a little over a year ago, my wife plans, my wife and I planned something that had I known I'd be running for Senate, I never would have done, which was a year ago we planned a trip to Israel. We were there two weeks ago. Um, had a young lady who was our guide for several days. Her name was Lana. She, when she was eight years old, she's now 29, when she was eight years old, her family immigrated from Russia, Soviet Union, to there. And I asked her, I said, Lana, when did you realize you were no longer a Russian immigrant, but now you were an Israeli? And she said, Richard, I can tell you exactly the moment. It was the moment I was 18 years old, I graduated from high school, and it was the moment I raised my hand to join the Israeli Defense Force. If you don't know, every woman goes in for two years in Israel, and every man serves for three years. Now, keep in mind, Israel is one quarter the size of the state of Indiana, surrounded on three sides by its enemies, 
The fourth side is the Mediterranean, which is why they call that the friendly coast. And I have to say, in the several days we spent with Lana and I met a lot of Israelis, there was a certain envy I had because every single Israeli has something in common with every other Israeli. How many of us as Americans have anything in common anymore? It was a welding force. You could just feel it. I mean, the first question when you start looking for a job is, what did you do in the military? Now, is that saying that we ought to have this uh, reinstatement of a national draft? No, I'm not to that point, because first of all, I think the best quality army is one that is a volunteer army, certainly uh, that's where we are today. But do I think that there's some logic, some basis for which we have some level of national service to bring some sort of commonality between us all? I think it's an interesting idea that needs to be pursued, because you know we've gone from being the melting pot to becoming the salad bowl. You know, we're not blending together as a country anymore. We see things so very, very differently. To the first part of the question on energy, and again, having spent 31 years in the energy business, I'd love to talk about energy. As far as what we do, is there plenty of oil? Let me rephrase that. Is there a lot of oil in the United States and that can be yet produced? Yes, there is. All kinds of oil, certainly offshore, in the Gulf, the eastern areas, of the, off Virginia, off Florida. There's all kinds of oil reserves out there if we want to go get them. Now, a lot of those reserves, especially the ones you hear of a lot in the news, like the Bakken Formation up in the Dakotas, it's a, there's a lot of oil in the Bakken Formations. But here's the thing, it's not $100 a barrel oil, and it's probably not $120 a barrel oil. It may not even be $130 a barrel oil. It's going to take a lot of technology to get that oil out because it comes from very tight, non-porous, non-permeable rock units. But why aren't we studying it now? Why aren't we making some level of investment now to pull it out? You know, nothing is more frustrating to me than to hear the people say, when uh, it's talk about Anwar, or even the Gulf Coast, well, it'll take 10 years to bring that oil on production, so we shouldn't do it. So 10 years from now, we're saying, gee, we don't have anything. What stupidity that is. You know, one thing that I also come away, I'm gonna tie two things together. The trip to Israel, and seeing how they live, with that constant certainty of risk. You know, Israelis have this certain sense of fatalism. They never wonder if there's going to be another war. They simply wonder when. They know it's coming. Their economy is thriving, by the way. Thriving. This whole global recession pretty well skipped Israel. They accept risk as a part of being human beings. And today, unfortunately, in the energy business, those who would try to stop things, say you can't drill in or you can't drill off the coast, oh, it's too risky. I'm sorry, life comes with risk. The benefits that come from having our own oil are profound. You know, one of the underreported economic development stories here in Indiana over the last several years, up in Whiting, Indiana, up in Lake County, inside the fence line of one of John D. Rockefeller's original standard oil refineries, I think it was first built in 1884, there has been a new refinery built. You hear it said there's been no new refiners in the United States in 20 or 30 years. Guess what? There's a new one right there in Whiting, Indiana. BP is British Petroleum. Spent $4 billion. And it's to process a totally different type of oil. Not oil that's pumped from the ground, but oil that's mined from the ground. The Western Canadian area, it's called the Athabascan tar sands in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and right along the border between those two provinces. They mine this stuff up, they crush it, they pulverize it, subject it to superheated steam, put it in a heated pipeline, send it 1,600 miles to Whiting, Indiana. It's an amazing thing. And you know, as quirky as the Canadians may be at times, I'd much rather send money to them than people who use our money to put explosive vests on children. You know, our energy needs are a vital part of our national security interest. And I think we spend far too much time uh, debating how we get our own energy than really going after it. The other thing that's driving me crazy, and I'm sure it does all of you, is when we see this administration give $3 billion grants to the Brazilians so they can do what? Drill off their shoulders and sell us the oil and create the 200,000 jobs, 200, jobs in South America. No. Let's do it here. We're never going to be energy independent for liquid fuels. It's never going to happen. But we can do a lot better job than we're doing right now. Yes, we have more. What's your opinion on the debt ceiling issue, and what fallout, if any, do you think will come if we do not raise the debt? 
Okay. Again, let me take the second part first. If we don't raise the debt limit, I have, here's my forecast for what it's worth, in my opinion. I think the first time it comes up for a vote in the House of Representatives, largely because of those 85 freshman Republicans who are still kind of feeling the ropes and they've got vinegar going through their blood right now, I think they're going to vote it down. I don't think it's going to pass. Then I think you're going to see some level, and I'm not quite sure what that means, but some level of crisis generated. You heard the president in his interview with CBS the other day saying, oh, we're going to quit making Social Security payments, or we may, and we just don't know where the money's coming from. By the way, let me put that in balance for a second. Between August 3rd and August 31st of this year, the projections are that the government will take in enough money so that it can pay all $29 billion that will come due during that period of principal and interest on the debt. They can pay $39 billion that will be due in uh, Social Security. They can pay up to $50 billion of all the Medicaid and Medicare bills that will come due, and that's all of them. They can pay all $34 billion of the bills that the defense contractors will send in. They will pay all $3 billion of the payroll due to our armed forces personnel. And they'll still have something like 12 to $14 billion left over. Now, that means a lot of things aren't going to get paid, but we've got enough to pay all those things I just mentioned. But I think you'll see the crisis agenda up by selectively picking who's going to get those for the greatest PR value. And I think when that happens, there'll be a second vote, and I suspect a number of them will cave in the second time it'll pass. Now, if, to the first part, if I were there, I would be one of those people absolutely insisting on saying, if we're going to, I'm not going to raise the debt limit. I'm not going to vote to raise the debt limit if there's nothing to change in. If we're just kicking the can down the road, just raise the number and raise the number. That's bad. We have to deal with this in a way that for every dollar of increases, we're getting at least that many dollars in cuts. We have to have, as part of that same vote, permanent caps put in place to make sure that the day after the vote, all those cuts don't just vaporize. And we go back to business as usual. And last, but certainly not least, we have to get real progress moving on a balanced budget amendment. And one that I like the best is presented by uh, Senator Mike Lee from Utah. And that one says we would permanently cap federal spending at 18% of our GDP. And that's still a huge number, by the way. But today we're almost at 26%. And by the way, let me, that leads me to something else I'm going to throw in. You know, as a person running against Senator Bluger, occasionally, occasionally I hear, well, you know, he's been there 35 years. He has so much seniority that does so much good for us. Yeah, I heard the Snickers. I'm going to go there. But here's the point. Mike Lee has been in the United States Senate seven months, and he's the sponsor of this bill. He's convinced 26 other Republicans to sign on as co-sponsors. He's been there seven months. It isn't about, it isn't about seniority. It's about a sense of purpose. It's about coming in with a different point of view. You know, any good business as you look around and you see boards of directors, they don't leave boards of directors on in perpetuity because they want new people coming in with new ideas. So with all respect to that seniority issue, you know, I could be very glib and say, what's it gotten for us lately? But even more as a practical matter, I think you need people to come in with new energy and a different sense of ideas. And I really see that in Mike Lee. I get asked, which senators most impress you? He's one of them at the very top. 